for those of you who have ever read a meta-analysis or performed a meta-analysis, you'll know that one of the first decisions you need to make is whether to use what's called the fixed effect model or the random effects model. There are two areas in meta-analysis that are probably very poorly understood, and this is one of them. The other one we're going to talk about later today or tomorrow, which is I squared. But this is something where you'll see many people that are writing a meta-analysis make a, a very common mistake. So let me explain to you how things should be done, and I'll explain to you what the mistake is and how to avoid it. Welcome to this lecture on fixed effect models versus random effects models in meta-analysis. This is Michael Borenstein, and this lecture is one in a series. This talk is based on a paper that we published in the journal Research Synthesis Methods. If you have access to that paper through your university or hospital, you can download it directly. If not, send me a note and I will send you a copy. My email is biostat100 at gmail.com. Before I start, I'd like to put in a plug for our two websites. This website describes our software, comprehensive meta-analysis, and the website is called simply metaanalysis.com. This website provides information on our workshops for meta-analysis, and this website is called metaanalysisworkshops.com. If you enter your email here, we'll be able to keep you informed of our new workshops and also of new videos like the one that you're watching now. With that out of the way, let's proceed. Those of you who have read a meta-analysis or performed a meta-analysis probably know that one of the first decisions we need to make is which statistical model to use. Most meta-analyses are based on one of two statistical models, the fixed effect model or the random effects model. Before starting, I want to make two points. The first point is this. When people speak about the differences between the fixed effect and the random effects models, we often talk about the fact that the two models yield different results. While this is true, I think it's misleading to focus on this point. The reason that the models yield different results is because the different models are asking fundamentally different questions. It's not the case that both models are addressing the same question and getting different answers. Rather, each model asks a different question and yields the correct answer for that question. We need to understand what question each model is asking and then choose the model that matches our goals. The second point is this. Many papers that report the results of a meta-analysis say that they started out without knowing which model they would use. Then they ran a test for heterogeneity and used this test to select a model. While this is a very common approach in some fields, it generally makes no sense. The choice of a model must reflect the goals of the systematic review. And these are goals that we set in advance based on what we're planning to do. I've sketched the two models over here, the fixed effect model on the left and the random effects model on the right. Let me start by running through an, an example of each. I know that most people watching this video use meta-analyses to assess the impact of an intervention, for example, to compare the means in two groups. However, a meta-analysis can also be used to estimate the mean score in one group. I'm going to start with an example where we are estimating a mean score in one group because this will allow me to explain the distinction between the two models most clearly. Then I'll show how the same ideas apply to the kinds of meta-analyses that are more common where we compare means or events in two groups. So let's start with the fixed effect model. The fixed effect model is appropriate when all studies in the analysis are estimating the same value. In practice, this means that all studies in the analysis are essentially identical to each other. They sample subjects from the same population, and all details of the study protocol are the same across all studies. For example, suppose that we work for a specific high school in Brooklyn, let's say the Thomas Jefferson High School and we want to find out how seniors in this school perform on a math test. We have a computer draw 20 sets of names with 100 kids in each set, and we treat each of these as one study. The kids in each study sit for a test. We compute the mean score for that study, and then we use a meta-analysis to synthesize the results. These will be our samples. We'll use the results from these 20 studies to estimate the mean for all seniors in the school. 
The correct model here is the fixed effect model because all studies in the analysis are estimating the same value. What do I mean when I say that all the studies are estimating the same value? Well, each study was a random sample from all the seniors at the same school. Let's assume that the mean score for all seniors in the school is 50. The mean score in the first sample was being used to estimate the mean for all seniors in the school. The mean score in the second sample was being used to estimate the mean for all seniors in the school, and so on. The sampling frame, the universe of potential samples, looks like this. The computer can generate an infinite number of samples with 100 kids in each, but the value being estimated by each sample is the same. It's the mean score for all seniors in the school, which in this example is 50 points. Since all studies are estimating the same value, the fixed effect model applies. Of course, the value that's actually observed in each sample will not be precisely 50 because of sampling error. But the true value, the value being estimated, is 50 in each of the potential samples. This model is called the fixed effect model. The word effect is in the singular because all studies share the same true effect. They're all estimating the same value. And the word fixed indicates that we're working with a fixed population. That is, we've designated this population specifically and have not sampled it at random from a universe of populations. This model is also sometimes called the common effect model because all co studies share a common effect size. By the way, I've used the simple phi here to indicate that we're estimating a common effect rather than the mean of many different effects. In any meta-analysis, the sampling frame determines how we can generalize the results. In this case, the sampling frame was limited to one population and one protocol. So the results apply only to this specific population and protocol. We don't know what the mean would be in another school, and we don't know what the mean might be if we gave the kids more time to complete the test. The next model is called the random effects model. The random effects model is the model that we use when we start with a universe of populations and then randomly sample populations from that universe. Let's use a variant of the prior example. This time, instead of working at the Thomas Jefferson High School, we're working for the Department of Education. And we want to know how kids across Brooklyn would do on the math test. We have the computer pick 20 schools at random from all the schools in Brooklyn. And then we have the computer pick 100 kids within each of these 20 schools. So again, we have 20 studies, but this time each is from a different school. The sampling frame, the universe of potential samples, looks like this. Unlike the prior example, where each potential sample was estimating the mean score in the same population, this time each potential sample is estimating the mean score in a different population and the mean score varies from school to school. For example, suppose that the mean score for all the schools in Brooklyn is 50. Does this imply that the mean score for each school is 50? Obviously not. Those of you who have been to Brooklyn probably know that there's a great deal of diversity. Some schools where few kids graduate, and some where almost all the kids go on to top-level universities. But even those of you who have never been to Brooklyn know that every school is different because that's just the way the world works. So the sampling frame looks like this, and the random effects model applies. This model is called the random effects model. The word effects is in the plural because we're sampling from a universe, Brooklyn, where each school has a unique mean score. And the word random reflects the assumption that the schools included in our meta-analysis are a random sample from this universe. I've used the symbol mu here to indicate that we're estimating a mean score. For the fixed effect model, I used the phi to indicate that we were estimating a common score. So now that we have some concrete examples, let's compare the two models on the following issues. First, the sampling frame and generalizability. Second, what the names mean. Third, what are the goals of the analysis. And fourth, how do I choose a model? First, the sampling frame and generalizability. The sampling frame is the universe of potential studies. We sample from this universe, and this also determines how we can generalize the results of the analysis. The fixed effect model assumes that we're sampling studies from one population and one study protocol. The results can be generalized to this specific population 
and this specific protocol. In this case, the population was the senior class at Thomas Jefferson High School, and the protocol was a specific version of the math test. The random effects model assumes that we've identified a universe of studies, and the true effect size is different for every study in the universe. The studies in our analysis are assumed to be a random sample of all studies in the universe. It follows that the results of our analysis can be generalized to the entire universe, all populations and protocols that are included in the sampling frame. In this case, the universe is all public high schools in Brooklyn. The mean score in our sample of 20 schools will serve as an estimate of the mean score for all schools in Brooklyn. With this in mind, we can make sense of the names that we've allocated to the two models. The first model is called fixed effect. The word effect is singular because all schools are estimating this, the same effect size, the mean score for the Thomas Jefferson High School. The word fixed refers to the fact that the population has been fixed or designated as the population of interest. It has not been sampled at random from a universe of different populations. The second model is called random effects. The word effects is plural because we're working with a universe of different effects, the universe being all public high schools in Brooklyn. And the word random reflects the fact that the studies in our analysis are assumed to be a random sample of all studies in that universe. Next, we can turn to the goals of the analysis. At left, since the true effect size is the same in all studies, the only value that we want to estimate is the common effect size, the mean score in the Thomas Jefferson High School. It doesn't make any sense to ask how much the mean score at the Thomas Jefferson High School varies because it's one mean score. It can't vary. It's true that the observed scores will vary from one sample to the next, but all of this variation must be due entirely to, to random sampling error. By contrast, at right, the mean score does vary across schools, so we want to know how much it varies. Let's consider three examples. In all of them, the mean is 50, but the range of scores varies from one example to the next. So suppose that the mean score for all the schools falls in the range of 45 to 55. In this case, we'd probably conclude that all the schools are functioning well. By contrast, suppose that the mean is again 50, but that some schools have mean scores as low as 30 and others as high as 70. In this case, we might conclude that all the schools are falling within an acceptable range, but that some are doing better than others. Finally, suppose that the mean once again is 50, but that the mean scores range from 20 points to 80 points. In this case, we'd probably conclude that some schools need to improve, while others are doing extremely well. How do we choose one model or the other? Well, think for a moment about the meaning of the word model. The model provides a context, a blueprint, for making sense of the numbers. We need to understand where the numbers come from if we want to understand how to analyze them. And that context is the sampling frame. In one case, we're working with one population, the Thomas Jefferson High School, and all studies were estimating the same value, which is the mean score in this school. So the fixed effect model applies. In the other case, we were working with a universe of different populations, all the high schools in Brooklyn, and we drew a random sample of these schools. So in this case, the random effects model applies. I mentioned earlier that an analysis based on the random effects model would generally give different results than an analysis based on the fixed effect model. This is largely irrelevant since there's not generally any good reason to compare the two models. They address different questions and they give different answers. However, it might be interesting to see what's going on behind the scenes. And now that you understand the logic behind the two models, it should be a simple matter to explain how the computational formulas differ, because these formulas are simply a way to match the logic of the sampling frame. Here's a fictional example based on the example of the math scores. I've included five studies in this analysis rather than 20 because it's easier to see what's going on. I'm not suggesting that this is the number I'd actually use in an analysis if I had the option to use more. In the first study, the mean score is 40. In the second, it's 45, and so on. This line gives me the fixed effect results. If these are five samples from the Thomas Jefferson High School, and I'm trying to estimate the mean score for that school, then these are my results. This line gives me the random effects results. 
If these are five samples from different schools and I'm trying to estimate the mean score across all schools in Brooklyn, then these are my results. So, given the same set of five effects, the summary statistics will differ depending on how the studies were sampled and how we want to generalize from the data. The first thing we notice is that the confidence interval is wider for the random effects model. The reason for that is pretty easy to explain. Under the fixed effect model, we compute the mean for the studies in the analysis. That yields a relatively narrow confidence interval. And there's no additional error since we only report the mean for these studies and don't extrapolate beyond them. The situation is different under the random effects model. Under the random effects model, we compute the mean for the schools in the analysis. And then we use that mean to estimate the mean for all schools from Brooklyn. There's a certain amount of error when we compute the mean for the schools in the analysis. And then there's additional error when we extrapolate from these schools to the other schools. So the confidence interval is wider. The second thing we notice is that the estimate of the mean is different under the two models. The effect sizes in the five studies are 40, 45, 50, 55, and 60. So the simple mean would be 50. That's what we would get if we gave each study the same weight. Yet the summary mean is higher than that, either 54 or 52, depending on the model. The reason that the mean is pulled to the right is that this study, which estimates the effect size as 60, happens to have a relatively large sample size. How do I know that it has a larger sample size than the other studies? Well, I know it immediately because I see that this study has a relatively narrow confidence interval. And the reason that the confidence interval is narrow is because the sample size is high. To confirm that, I can click on this tool, and the program will show me the sample size for each study. As expected, the other studies enrolled 10 students each, but this one enrolled 50 students. It should be intuitive, then, that this study gets more weight in the analysis and pulls the mean to the right. While the simple mean would be 50, the computed mean is higher than that. What we need to understand, though, is why this study has more of an impact under the fixed effect model, where it pulled the mean all the way to 54, and less of an impact under the random effects model, where it pulled the mean only to 52. To understand the reason, let's have another look at the sampling frames. At left, all samples are estimating the mean score at the Thomas Jefferson High School. And at right, each sample is estimating the mean at a different high school. The sampling frame shows the potential studies that we might include. Suppose we happen to sample the studies shown here. At left, suppose that four samples had 10 kids each and one had 50. Since all samples are estimating the same value, and one has five times as much information about that value as the others, we should give that sample five times as much weight. One way to think about this is to imagine what would happen if instead of treating this as five separate studies, we put all of the individual scores from the 90 students into one spreadsheet and computed the mean. If we did this, the 50 students who came from the large study as a group would get five times as much weight as those from any other study. And that's exactly what we're doing when we work with the summary scores and assign five times as much weight to the large study. By contrast, consider what's happening at the right when each study comes from a different school and our goal is to estimate the mean for all schools. Again, suppose that in four schools we sampled 10 kids and in the fifth we sampled 50. We do not want to give this study five times as much weight as the others. Each school is being used to estimate the mean for all the schools in Brooklyn, and there's no reason to think that this school falls any closer to the grand mean than the other schools do. For example, the school with a large sample could be this one, which falls quite some distance from the mean of all the schools. So we don't want the study to carry too much weight in the analysis. At the same time, we do want to give the study at least a little more weight than the others, because we're working with estimates of the mean in each school, and we, know, and we know the mean in this school more precisely than we know the means in the other schools. For this reason, we adopt a kind of a hybrid approach. Here, the large study gets five times as much weight as the small ones, and here it gets twice as much weight as the small ones. So it still gets more weight, but not so much that it dominates the analysis. And in fact, we can see that in CMA. If I click, if I click the button to show weights, 
I can see that under the fixed effect model, this study gets five times as much weight as any other study, and therefore pulls the mean all the way to here. But under the random effects model, this study gets twice as much weight as any other study, so it still pulls the mean to the right, but only as far as here. A few disclaimers. First, in this analysis, the large study actually did get the weights that I mentioned, five times as much weight as the other studies under this model and twice as much weight under this model. But the details of how much weight will depend on many factors, and I'll discuss that in another module. Second, it will always be the case that the confidence interval is wider under the random effects model and more narrow under the fixed effect model. But when it comes to the effect size, this can go either way. Either model could give the higher estimate. The basic principle is that large studies have more of an impact than small studies under both models, but the difference tends to be more pronounced under the fixed effect model, where large studies may dominate the analysis. Finally, let me emphasize that this discussion about weights was intended as a conceptual overview, and I've tried to convey the basic ideas without being too technical. For example, I said that the weights are based on each study's sample size. They're actually based on the error variance of each study. In this specific example, the variance and sample size turn out to yield the same result, but that's not generally the case. For those of you who want to know the computational details, these are given in the paper, and I cover them in another module. Now that I've shown that each model reflects a distinct sampling frame, let's consider how this translates into the kinds of analyses that most of us actually perform. When we were working with studies that came from the same school, the fixed effect model applied. And when we were working with studies that came from different schools, the random effects model applied. The same logic applies when we're looking at studies that assess the impact of an intervention. If we're working with a series of studies that are based on one population and that are identical to each other in all material ways, then the fixed effect model applies. If the studies are based on different populations or differ from each other in any material way, then the random effects model applies. So here's an example where the fixed effect model would apply. Suppose that we're working for a drug company and we run a series of identical studies based on the same population. This is analogous to the case of the single school and we use the fixed effect model. But when the analysis is based on studies that are pulled from the literature, especially if we're working in the social sciences or medicine and assessing the impact of an intervention, it's difficult to think of cases where all the studies are estimating the same value. When we pull studies from the literature, every study is based on a different population. And common sense tells us that the impact will vary from one population to the next. That's just the way things are. A vaccine will have more of an impact in some populations than others. A drug will work better in some populations than in others. A tutoring program will have more of an impact in some schools than in others. In some cases, the variation in effect will be substantial, and in some, it will be trivial. But unless we can be certain that the impact is precisely the same in all cases, then the random effects model is the one that we should be using. If we think back to the difference between the two models, the random effects model is the one that fits the data since it allows us to work with multiple populations. The random effects model is the one that allows us to generalize from the populations that are actually in our analysis to similar populations. And the random effects model is the one that allows us to discuss how the effect size varies across studies. And these are all things that we want to do. By contrast, the fixed effect model allows for none of these things. So the bottom line is that in almost all cases, if we're pulling studies from the literature, we should be using the random effects model. In fact, I could have started this lecture by discussing the random effects model and ignoring the fixed effect model entirely. The reason that I chose to discuss the fixed effect model is to explain that it can only be used under some very strict conditions. So you'll understand that, for the most part, your studies do not meet these conditions. I felt it was important to do that because we see the fixed effect model used in many cases where it really should not be used. One of my goals in these workshops is to highlight mistakes that people make in meta-analysis and encourage you to avoid these mistakes. I'm going to address one of those mistakes now. At this point, I've discussed how we select the model, and I've said that when we're working with studies that assess the impact of an intervention and the studies are pulled from the literature, 
the random effect model is the one that best fits the sampling frame. Most experts agree with this. Some don't. Some recommend advanced models that we won't be discussing here. But what is clear is that the selection of a model should always be based on our understanding of the sampling frame, how the studies were selected, and how we plan to generalize from them. That's the whole idea of a statistical model. And I've indicated that by a check mark over here. Often in the literature, we see people taking a very different approach. They start with the fixed effect model, they run a test for heterogeneity to see if there's evidence that the effect size varies from study to study. If the test is statistically significant, they switch to the random effects model, and otherwise they stay with the fixed effect model. This approach is nonsense. If I've drawn 20 random samples of kids from the Thomas Jefferson High School, then I know that I should be using the fixed effect model. And if I've drawn 20 samples from 20 different high schools, then I know that I should be using the random effects model. I don't need a test to tell me which model applies. I simply need to know what I've been doing for the past few months to gather the data. The same idea applies to meta-analyses that assess the impact of an intervention. If I've spent the past month running identical studies with the same population, then I know that's what I did. On the other hand, if my desk is piled high with reprints of studies that, that I pulled from the literature based on different populations, then again, I know that's what I did. I don't need a test to tell me that. So the idea that we should use a test to tell us which model to use cannot be justified. Yet, let me show you some examples where researchers did precisely that. This paper says, if the studies were found to be highly heterogeneous and a large amount of between-study variation existed, it would be important to account for this variation by using a random effects model. And then it continues, if the opposite were true, a fixed effect model was justified. So they're using the data to determine what the sampling frame had been, and that's wrong. Here's another one. This paper says a standard fixed effect model was used in the absence of heterogeneity among studies. In the presence of heterogeneity, the random effects model was used. Again, this is wrong. They're looking for evidence that the true effect size varied across studies. But based on the fact that the studies employed different populations, they can assume that the true effect size varied. This paper says we used the fixed effects models to perform meta-analyses if the heterogeneity between studies was estimated to be lower than 50%. I'll point out that not only is this wrong, since we should not be using the observed dispersion to select a model, it also doesn't make any sense. What does it mean to have heterogeneity that is less than 50%? 50% of what? I actually know what this person had in mind, and we'll get to that later, when we talk about the second most common mistake in meta-analysis. We'll cover that in a different module. But the basic idea is still that they're using the data to tell them how the studies had been sampled, and that doesn't make any sense. By contrast, some papers get it right. This paper explains that, in the case of a fixed effects model, one assumes a fixed population effect size. In contrast, random effects models assume that the effect sizes are sampled from a population of effect sizes. I would have said a universe of effect sizes, but we mean the same thing. So my point is simply that these people should base their decision on their knowledge of how the studies were sampled, and it's a mistake to base their decision on a statistical test. What makes this worse is that the test for heterogeneity, the one that they're using to make the decision, has very poor power. This means that the test for heterogeneity may yield a non-significant p-value even when the effect size varies substantially from study to study. So, when researchers use this test to decide between the two models, they often end up using the fixed effect model when they should be using the random effects model. What happens if I should be using the random effects model, but I use the fixed effect model instead? Well, a moment ago we saw that the statistics depend on the model. So, if we use the wrong model, our estimates of the various statistics will be wrong. Our estimate of the effect size will be wrong and the confidence interval will be wrong. Specifically, the confidence interval will be too narrow. I should also be clear that the errors can be substantial. In the example that I showed a few minutes ago, the estimates based on the two models were not terribly different from each other. But in some cases, they'll differ substantially. Aside from the fact that the numbers will be wrong, if we use the wrong model, the interpretation of the analysis will be wrong. Remember, the selection of a model not only affects the numbers, it also tells us what those numbers mean. To use the analogy of the schools in Brooklyn, 
Suppose we're working with all the schools in Brooklyn, but the test for heterogeneity is not statistically significant, and we make the mistake of switching to the fixed effect model. At this point, it's not clear what the summary score is intended to represent. By definition, it must represent the common score for all the schools in Brooklyn, while common sense tells us that there is no such thing. Let me move on to something else briefly. I've said that the random effects model gives different results than the fixed effect model. There's actually one exception to this rule. In the computations, the difference between the models depends on the estimate of the between-study variance, how much of the true effect size varies from study to study. That number is called Tau square. And when that value is estimated as zero, the two models give the same results. You can see over here that when Tau square is zero, the weight under the fixed effect model and the weight under the random effects model become the same thing. For example, here's the analysis that we looked at this morning. The studies compare two treatments, and the risk ratio is 0.85, which tells us that one treatment reduces the risk by 15% as compared to the other. You'll see that the effect size, the confidence interval, and the p-value are the same under both models. This is because the between-study variance is being estimated as zero. You might be wondering, how can it be zero? After all, I've been saying that the between-study variance is almost never zero, that the drug's impact almost always varies, at least by a little. Does this mean that I'm wrong? Well, probably not. Remember, we don't know how much the effect size varies. We estimate it. And like most estimates, our estimate is sometimes too high and sometimes too low. If the actual variation is trivial and we underestimate it, then we end up with an estimate of zero. And that's the number that we use in the analysis, despite the fact that the true effect size almost certainly does vary from study to study. I should point out one more thing about this. When a researcher plans to use the random effects model, but the between-study variance is estimated as zero, the researcher will often report that they're now using the fixed effect model. This is wrong. They're still using the random effects model. It just so happens that another model would yield the same results. There are some other myths about fixed effect versus random effects models, and let me take a moment to address a few of them. I've seen some papers suggest that the random effects model always yields a higher estimate of the effect size than the fixed effect model, and I've seen some papers that suggest the opposite. In fact, both of these are incorrect. Under the fixed effect model, large studies will be more likely to dominate the analysis. If those studies happen to have large effects, then the fixed effect weights will yield the larger effect size. Conversely, if those studies happen to have small effects, then the fixed effect weights will yield the smaller effect size. Next, there's a common belief that the random effects model is more conservative than the fixed effect model. For example, this person says, generally, the random effects estimates are more conservative than fixed effect estimates. This refers to the fact that the confidence interval will always be wider under the random effects model. However, I wouldn't say that the random effects model is more conservative for two reasons. The first point is technical. It's true that the confidence interval will always be wider under the random effects model. However, in any given analysis, the random effects model may yield a higher estimate of the effect size. So, in any given analysis, it's possible for the random effects model to yield a significant test of the null, even when the fixed effect model does not. The second point is more fundamental. I think it's a mistake to talk about one model being more conservative than the other. That line of thought tends to perpetuate the idea that we can select one model or the other arbitrarily. The two models address two different types of data. If we're working with one school, then the fixed effect model provides the best estimate of the mean and confidence interval for that school. The random effects model might yield a wider confidence interval, but the only important point is that it would be the wrong interval. Conversely, if we're working with many schools, then the random effects model applies. The important point about the confidence interval is not that it's wider than the interval based on another model. The important point is that it's the correct interval. So the take-home message from this module would be as follows. The two models represent fundamentally different sampling frames, and when we're pulling studies from the literature, it's almost always the case that the random effects model fits the sampling frame, and that's the model that we should be using.
While the random effects model is the one that we should be using, we also need to be aware of some limitations. I started this module with an example where we were sampling schools from all the schools in Brooklyn. That's a textbook case in the sense that the model's assumptions are probably being met, and so the model probably works reasonably well. In practice, when we're pulling studies from the literature, it's less likely that we'll be meeting these assumptions. One assumption is that we can define the universe of effects. In the school example, the universe is clear. It's all the public high schools in Brooklyn. In other cases, though, it's more difficult to define the universe. For example, suppose that we decide that we'll include studies that used randomized trials to compare a drug versus a placebo, where the patients were between 20 and 60 years of age, and the dose of the drug was between 10 and 20 milligrams. Does a universe include studies where the patients are in good health or in poor health? Does it include studies where the drug was given short-term or long-term? Of course, we can always be more detailed with our criteria, but my point is that there are limits to how carefully we can define the universe from which we sample. The second problem is this. Even if we're able to define the universe carefully, it's not that easy to draw a random sample of all the effect sizes in the universe. Again, it's relatively simple to draw a random sample of effect sizes when we're working with the schools in Brooklyn. We simply draw a random sample of all the schools in Brooklyn. But it's more difficult when we're looking for studies that assess the impact of a drug. For example, suppose that the drug's effect varies with age. If that's true, then to obtain a sample that accurately reflects the drug's impact for our universe, we need to include studies with patients from all relevant age groups. But what if most of the actual studies enrolled older patients? Then our mean effect would be influenced by those patients, even though we plan to generalize to the entire universe as we've defined it. Perhaps the most serious problem with the random effects model is the following. In order to apply the model correctly, we need to have a reasonably precise estimate for the between-study variance. We need to know how much the effect size varies from study to study in the universe from which the effect sizes were sampled. Basically, what we're doing is computing the standard deviation of the effects. And the sample size for this computation is the number of studies in the analysis. If we have 20 studies in the analysis, we're estimating the standard deviation based on 20 studies, which will probably yield a reasonably precise estimate. If we have 10 studies in the analysis, we might be able to get by. But if we're working with five studies or even less, it should be clear that our estimate will not be terribly precise. The extent of the problem varies from one analysis to another. In some fields, we actually might get many studies in the analysis, so this is not likely to be a problem. And in some fields, this might not be a serious problem because the actual amount of variance tends to be small. For example, if we're looking at the impact of a drug and we can ensure that the populations are relatively homogeneous, we might be able to ensure that the study-to-study -study variation is minimal. In that case, if we underestimate or overestimate the variation by a small amount, the results will still be reasonably accurate. And as we proceed through the various examples over the next few days, I'll show how we can use statistics to address the problem. For example, we can expand the confidence interval about the mean. My basic point is that while the random effects model is the one that we should be using, we do need to be aware of its limitations. I should also say that some people recommend against this model because of the problems that I've just outlined. In particular, Richard Pito recommends a third model. His model may be called the fixed effects model, where the word effects is in the plural, to distinguish it from the model that I've been calling the fixed effect model in the singular. Relatively few people agree with that approach, and I won't cover it here. While it does address some of the concerns that I've outlined, I think it replaces them with issues that are even more problematic. So that's it for this module. Please take a moment to visit our websites, sign up at either one, and we'll send newsletters and information about our workshops. The website for our program is metaanalysis.com, and the website for our workshops is metaanalysisworkshops.com. And on that site, you can sign up here. This is Michael Borenstein, and thanks very much for your attention.